Hi, and welcome back. In my previous video on rocks and clocks, we talked about the difference between relative and absolute dating, and we talked about how radioactive isotopes found in igneous rock can actually be used to determine the almost the exact age of the rocks in which those crystals are found. In this episode, we're going to talk in more detail about the different types of isotopes that are used in, um, in, in radiometric dating, and we'll talk about uh, the pros and cons to the different uh, types of analyses that are done. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about the different types of radioisotopes that are commonly used to perform radiometric dating on rock samples to determine the age of those rocks through absolute dating techniques. Um, there are lots of different types of analyses, and, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, but I'm going to go through some of the more common ones that are analyzed to determine the, 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 the dates uh, of, of rock strata, uh, in particular ones that are used uh, in evolutionary biology to help us date rock strata and determine how old certain fossils happen to be. Um, so the first one that we'll actually talk about is a technique called radiocarbon dating. So radiocarbon dating uh, focuses on a heavy isotope of carbon called C14 or carbon-14. So uh, carbon-14 is actually formed in the atmosphere through uh, the activity of thermal neutrons that interact with nitrogen atoms. Uh, the end result is to produce a heavy carbon atom um, that has two extra neutrons. So instead of having six neutrons, it has eight um, to produce carbon-14. Now this particular um, isotope carbon-14 represents only one out of every 10 to the 12th uh, carbon atoms on the planet, which is actually about one in every one trillion. So there's not a ton of it there, but it's actually more than enough uh, to be measured using uh, radiometric dating techniques. So uh, what's important about that is this. Uh, in living samples, um, the radiometric, the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio um, is actually consistent with what we find in the atmosphere, and that, that's across all uh, across all living things uh, as far as we know and it, it kind of happens this way so um, photoautotrophs for example like plants they're going to bring in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, that carbon dioxide about one in every one trillion carbon dioxide at, uh, molecules is actually going to have a uh, c14 carbon in it as opposed to a c12 um, carbon atom in it um, and then that C14 will be incorporated into the biological molecules that it produces, things like carbohydrates and uh, even nucleic acids and proteins. And then uh, that carbon-14 gets spread throughout the, 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 the food chain, um, just like any other nutrient would. So the bottom line is over time, um, the C14 to C12 ratios in pretty much all living things is going to be consistent with what we find in the atmosphere. Now, the cool part about carbon-14 is it is radioactive. Um, it's not going to like kill you with a level of reactivity. It's not, you know, not like uranium or anything like that, but it is radioactive and it does decay with a half-life of just around, uh, 5,700 years. So, um, if we can figure out once something dies, um, what ends up happening is they cease to incorporate carbon-14 anymore. And over time, that carbon-14 slowly degrades. And if you look at a sample that's about 5,700 years old, you would find that the ratio of C14 to C12 is about half what it was uh, when that thing was alive. It's about half of what we find in the atmosphere. Um, so that would tell you that one half-life has passed, and that sample is about 5,700 years old. So what we can actually do is for uh, samples of biological origin, and that's key, it has to be a sample of biological origin because it has to incorporate that atmospheric carbon-14. Um, you know, rocks don't do that. Um, we could look at the C14 to C12 ratio and we could uh, get a pretty accurate date as long as that sample is somewhere uh, younger than 45 to 50,000 years old. So that's kind of the limitation. So the pros to, to, to radiocarbon dating is it's quite accurate. Um, the cons uh, are going to be, first off, that sample needs to be of biologic origin. It can't be a rock. It has to be something that was uh, alive um, and not been dead for more than 50,000 years because there is an upper limit to how old a sample could be. The simple reason is we start off with a ratio of one to a trillion um, and over half-lives that degrades more and more and more to the point where it's just no longer detectable after 
45,000 to 50,000 years old. Um, so as long as those caveats are met, it's of biological origin and the sample is less than 50,000 years old, uh, you can get some profoundly accurate results with radiocarbon dating. Now, some of the other more common radiometric dating techniques don't focus on carbon at all. They're going to focus on um, radioisotopes such as potassium-40. So potassium-40 uh, is a radioactive isotope that is found in the center of the Earth. Um, it does make it up to the surface in the form of igneous rock layers when those rock layers form, and it can be isolated from things like uh, clay minerals and tephra, uh, things like that. Uh, and the crystals that are contained within them um, will contain uh, potassium-40, which over time decays to its daughter nuclide, which is uh, argon-40. So potassium argon, it's also known as a potassium argon clock. Uh, the rate of decay for potassium-40, its half-life is about 1.3 billion years. Um, potassium, the potassium argon clock has been used consistently throughout much of the 20th century to date uh, rock strata and also help provide dates for fossils uh, in the surrounding sedimentary rock strata. Um, and it's found to be exceedingly accurate. Um, because the half-life is about one point. Uh, three billion years, uh, the samples need to be older than about 100,000 years in order to be analyzed using this technique. Main reason being uh, that less than 100, 000, if less than 100,000 years have passed, simply not enough of the potassium-40 has undergone radioactive decay at that point to give reliable results. So that's kind of the downside to it. While it is highly accurate, the techniques are widely, are, are, are thoroughly established, uh, the sample does need to be um, 100,000 years old or greater if you're going to use this particular radioisotope to do your radiometric dating. Um, the good news is it's also useful on rock. This thing does not need to be of biological origin, and that's going to be the case for pretty much everything else that we talk about. It's really only radiocarbon dating that insists that that thing still has some amount of organic material still in it. Uranium is also a very useful um, element for radiometric dating. Uh, there's actually three different useful uh, radioactive isotopes of uranium, U-238, U-235, and U-234. Um, so U-238 and U-235 both decay into lead products. U-238 decays into lead-206 uh, with a half-life right around 4.6 billion years. So with the Earth being about 4.6 billion years now, um, the uranium is reaching its first half-life on the planet Earth uh, at this point. Um, U-235 has a half-life right around 700 million years, and it decays into lead-206 as its stable daughter nuclide. And then U-234 actually degrades into thorium-230. Um, that half-life is significantly shorter, right around uh, 234,000 years. Um, and uh, while U-238 and U-235 very commonly are found in zircon crystals inside of igneous rock layers, uh, U-234 is usually isolated from calcium carbonate-containing um, um, rocks and has a slightly it's it's not as commonly used it has very select purposes that we use 234 so let's focus a little bit on u238 and u235 um, u238 and u235 are some of the most commonly used perhaps the most commonly used uh, uh, radioactive isotopes for radiometric dating um, what's really neat is that quite often crystals will contain both u235 and u238 at the same time um, as well the entire rock layer and what's awesome is they actually serve as each other's internal controls so if you do the u-235 and, and compare it that the, you know the ratio of u-235 to lead 207 and then you compare the ratio of uranium 238 to lead 206 and in the end you get the same date measurement you can be fairly confident that your results are accurate because you've used two entirely different radio radioisotopes uh, radioactive isotopes to achieve the same end result, sort of its own internal control, which is pretty awesome. Um, now, because the half-lives are pretty old, um, the uranium dating isn't typically done um, until a sample is at least a million years old. Um, so, you know, there is a bit of a limitation there. So, um, you know, if something's less than a million years old, it becomes hard to do uranium dating on just simply because there's not enough uranium around to do either you the to either do the U-238 or the U-235 uh, testing. So, you know, there is sort of that window of it's too young to be dated this way, but uh, we'll discuss there are some other means uh, of dating it. But nevertheless, it's, it's heavily, it's highly reliable. And just like potassium argon, um, you know, there's there the, the techniques are so well established that 
you reliable results are, are almost always achieved. Now, there is another dating technique that actually utilizes uranium. Um, so uh, U-238 um, produces, it undergoes something called spontaneous fission decay. And if you look at crystals that have undergone fission decay, they actually make these things called fission tracks. Uh, so this leads to something called uh, fission track dating. Um, and these fission tracks are actually physical marks that you can observe um, the, the damage that is produced by that spontaneous fission decay. And this, the rate of fission decay actually occurs, uh, is actually a, it's actually a known rate. Uh, the only thing you really need to figure out in order to provide a proper, um, a proper date is to actually utilize the 235. So um, U-235 does not undergo spontaneous uh, fission decay, which means it doesn't produce these tracks, this, these fission tracks. So what you can do is you actually can bombard it with thermal neutrons uh, to induce that type of, of, of fission decay with the U-235. And the way you do it, and I don't want to get too bogged down in the details, but uh, the bottom line is, is you measure the amount of induced U-235 fission tracks compared to the already existent spontaneous fission tracks from the U-238. And that ratio of induced to uh, naturally occurring fission tracks can actually work out proportionally to give you the date of that particular sample. Um, what's nice about this is you're using something that's already present, plus this fission track dating is actually useful for figuring out the dates of rock layers that are anywhere between 100,000 and 2 billion years old. So you get a pretty broad spread uh, using a pretty reliable technique to determine exactly how old that particular sample is. Another technique that's commonly used is called luminescence. So luminescence is interesting. It's not technically radiometric dating because we're not relying on looking at the ratio of you know decay product to um, parent isotope. Instead, what we're actually looking at is sort of indirect evidence of those radioisotopes. It's a type of damage that gets caused by the radioactive decay that's occurring within a sample. So what ends up happening is um, as radioisotopes decay, they release energy, and this energy is absorbed by the sample, and it gets trapped in these things called electron traps, um, which actually can, when they're exposed to light, can actually give off luminescence. They can actually, like when they get exposed to light or high heat, these react, these, this trapped energy gets released and it can actually be measured um, as a form of light, okay? Well, this technique presupposes that whatever the sample is has been buried, as in other words, it has not been exposed to light or it has not been exposed to intense heat um, since that particular sample began to decay. So uh, what ends up happening is you harvest these samples and then you bombard them with light and you look at how much uh, or heat in some cases, and you look up at how much luminescence that sample gives off, and the amount of luminescence that's there can tell you how much energy has been absorbed by the radioactive decay that occurs in these samples, and then you can actually use that to determine exactly how old that sample happens to be. Again, this is a very well-established technique that gives very reliable results. The beauty of luminescence dating is it gives very reliable information about how old a sample is up to about 100,000 years. So anything beyond 100,000 years isn't particularly useful, but anywhere between zero and 100,000 years is actually quite useful for determining how old a sample uh, might be, particularly if it's already been buried or you know that it hasn't been exposed. You can tell, for example, how long ago it's been since a lava bed um, had been uh, laid down if you use the rocks that have been trapped and not exposed to the sun at that point. So uh, that's, that's very helpful because it kind of fills in that gap. If you recall, things like potassium argon really aren't good for samples that are younger than 100,000 years. Things like um, you know, uranium dating isn't good until the sample is at least 1 million years old. So um, luminescence provides very reliable data in sort of that more recent time window uh, for certain samples. So how reliable is radiometric dating? And it turns out the answer is it's pretty super reliable. Um, there have been some that have tried to argue, you know, that there are defects in the system or that the data is not that reliable. A lot of times people have gone on to use, you know, inappropriate techniques or sample preparations to find out. So for example, some people have tried to do experiments where they use radiocarbon dating to date fossils, uh, dinosaur fossils from like the Jurassic or the Cretaceous period. Well, that's not going to work. I mean, those samples, for starters, they're hundreds of millions of years old. They're not within that 45,000 year time window for which radiocarbon dating is useful. And, and moreover, there's no carbon left. I mean, yes, they're of biological origin, but they've hence turned fossilized into rock. There's no carbon there to do the dating on. So it's just an inappropriate use of the technique to try to disprove that it works. No. 
Um, time and time again, radiometric dating has been tested in various ways. So for example, you can take samples of a known age and then you could give them to various labs and say, okay, you all do different tests and yep, that's how old it is, all the tests agree. And the thing to realize again with all of this radiometric dating is it's not one lab analyzing one crystal from one rock and saying, yep, it's isolating many crystals from many different rocks of the same period, being analyzed by many different labs using many different techniques. I mean, I really only covered potassium argon and a few other different dating techniques. There are others out there that are regularly used. So what you'd like to do is use multiple tests from multiple labs to corroborate um, the particular date of a rock. And when they all agree, it's really hard to find a reason why all of these different techniques would agree that a certain rock is a certain age. Um, other than it just is. Um, so radiometric dating is, is one of the most accurate tools that we have uh, for understanding the geology of the planet Earth. Still, I guess one criticism about it could be that, well, the radiometric dating agrees with itself, right? So how is that fair? You're using, I mean, even if you're using potassium argon clocks to corroborate uranium data, you know, it's still radiometric dating. What if there, you know, is there any other way to corroborate this? And it turns out, Actually, there is a pretty cool way um, in which you can corroborate radiometric dating. Um, and this was actually an experiment done by a professor named John Wells at Cornell University. Um, he wrote something called Coral Clocks and Geochronometry that he published in the 1960s. Um, and in this, John Wells uses two fairly obscure and at first seemingly unrelated facts about the planet Earth and about life um, to actually show that the radiometric dating that was really sort of kind of coming into its own at that particular point in time was quite accurate. He relied on two facts. One is the fact that the moon is slowly slowing down the Earth's rotation, and it does so by pulling on the oceans. So over time, um, the ocean tides are actually slowing the spin of the planet Earth, which is kind of crazy. Um, but it's 100% true. It's just literally through the friction of the tides slowing the spin of the Earth down. Now, to be fair, it's not like we're going to be coming to a stop anytime soon. It only slows the rotation of the Earth, or lengthens the day, I should say, by about 20 seconds every 1 million years. But still, over a few hundred million years, that can actually add up. The other obscure fact that he applied was the fact that coral clocks, not, like, uh, not unlike trees, have annual growth rings. But they also have daily growth rings. So in other words, if you look at a coral species that's been fossilized and you look at its daily growth readings and its annual growth rings, you can actually figure out um, exactly how many days were in a given year at the time that that coral species existed. So uh, being from Cornell, uh, John Wells actually analyzed some horn corals that were found in Western New York, um, which is near and dear to me because that's near where I live. Um, and found that uh, at the time of these Devonian corals being in existence, there was only there were actually 400 days uh, in a year. So there were 400 daily growth bands for every one annual growth band. Uh, so that told them there were 400 days in the year, which means that each day was somewhere between 21 and a half and 22 hours long. In other words, uh, the days were two hours shorter when these corals grew back in the Devonian times. Um, than it is today. So if you just do kind of the quick math about, you know, you know, 20 seconds per 1 million years and how long it would take to shave off, you know, two full hours from a day, you get a calculation that says that these corals lived about 350 and 400 million years old, which is great because prior to this, the data from radiometric dating had basically said, yeah, the Devonian was somewhere between 360 and 420 million years ago. So in other words, these coral clocks agree perfectly with the radiometric data, which is, in my eyes, a pretty amazing scientific experiment, right? This guy literally used fossilized corals to corroborate uh, how accurate radiometric dating was back in the 1960s, uh, which is pretty awesome. Now, before I, I let you go uh, in this conversation about clocks, I wanted to introduce one more conversation uh, or one more type of clock that we can use, and these are called molecular clocks. So, Molecular clocks are kind of interesting. They're not like radiometric dating. They're not even like coral clocks. Uh, they're based on observations that were made by Linus Pauling and a colleague named Zucker Landl, um, who was looking at um, hemoglobin proteins. And what they noticed was 
if you look at the number of amino acid substitutions um, in the hemoglobin protein uh, across various species, you can see that these what are referred to as neutral mutations, uh, since they really didn't have any impact on survival, they became fixed in these proteins at a pretty linear rate. In other words, um, you know, you could say over time that the, for example, with hemoglobin, it was, the rate of mutation was about one amino acid every million years. Um, and they proposed then that if we could analyze gene mutations or protein mutations, um, the number of amino acid substitutions might actually within proteins might actually be able to tell us how old certain events happen to be or how long ago since certain events took place and this established the idea of something called a molecular clock and since then uh, several other genes have also been analyzed and found that the protein mutation the amino acid substitution the resulting proteins um, does actually seem to occur on a fairly linear rate with respect to time um, and these molecular clocks have become more and more used uh, to help date certain things. Now, uh, there are a lot of caveats. First and foremost, I will openly state that molecular clocks are by far and away the least accurate of the clocks that we've talked about. They're nowhere near as reliable at forming dates as, for example, radiometric dating or radiocarbon dating. But they are useful in a few contexts. First and foremost, they can give us ideas about when two species diverge, when we don't have the fossil data to show that so for example we don't really have fossil data to show exactly when humans and chimpanzees diverge but if we look at the molecular clocks they'll tell us that it happened somewhere between six and seven million years ago uh, based on the number of amino differences in our amino acid proteins or our cytochrome c proteins which all kind of agree with each other um, the other you know thing that you need to do when you have a molecular clock is you need to be able to tie it to some known events you need to know for example from fossil evidence how long ago it's been since certain species existed you need these benchmarks to sort of calibrate the clocks and the more data you the more physical data you have in the form of fossils for example or ge geologic data that you have um, the more calibrated your clocks can be and the more accurate your results are so while it's often hard to use a molecular clock to say this happened you know this happened one million years ago well it might be one million years ago plus or minus two or three million years it gives you an idea and an understanding of certain events that you don't necessarily have fossil evidence for. And sometimes we've found these molecular clocks to be exceedingly accurate, and other times we've had to refine them a bit as we get fossil evidence or different types of evidence to help uh, sort of refine the dates. But nevertheless, molecular clocks are used to help us understand when some big dates might have happened. So for example, molecular clocks can be utilized to provide evidence for when we think, for example, um, you know, I mentioned in another video that we think that nadarians and uh, bilateral animals and sponges all diverged from each other somewhere around 700 million years ago back in the cryogenian. Do we have fossil evidence of that? No, but when we look at molecular clocks, they all kind of guide us to the fact that it's been about 700 or 750 million years since all three of those branches of life were united as a common ancestor. So they are useful in that particular context. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot today. We talked about different types of dating techniques, particularly focusing on uh, radiocarbon and other forms of radiometric dating. But we also learned about molecular clocks and how, the, how they can be useful and even coral clocks. And while coral clocks don't really have um, a use in everyday dating techniques, it's a pretty neat example of how we can use different branches of science to corroborate the findings of other branches of science. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye.